Hey everybody, Brian Goulet here of GouletPens.com, and this is episode number 197 of Goulet Q&A. And I took last week off, sort of. I kind of doubled down the previous week, and I shot that awesome video with Brian Gray of Edison Pens, and if you've not seen that yet, definitely go check that one out. So that took the place of Q&A, um, but uh, we are continuing on. As normal here, now that I am through my gauntlet of traveling, so I went from having the holidays, no, I went from my trip to Germany at the beginning of December, and then I had the holidays, uh, in which case I went to Northern Virginia to see my in-laws, which are about two hours away, that wasn't too bad. And then the next week I went to Ohio uh, to see Edison Pens, and then came back for like three days, and then went to California, where I just got back couple days ago. So that was a lot of gadding about for me. I'm looking to park it for just a little bit now because I've been traveling a lot. Rachel's been holding down the fort with the kids. My parents have been helping and it's been a group effort. Uh, team has been holding things down here and it's been uh, very interesting times for me uh, in a very good way though. Very fruitful time. So um, where I was, uh, well, let's talk about Edison first. Okay. So I um, had this nice interview with Brian Gray. So that was really cool. And uh, Got to get lots of perspective on that. And uh, so the whole reason that I was going there, I we've been doing business together for seven years and I've never seen their place. Um, so, you know, while I was in the traveling mood, I thought I would go ahead and do that. And of course, what better place to go the first week of January than Northern Ohio, just south of Lake Erie. So it was, <laughs> it was super cold. It was a high of seven degrees Fahrenheit the entire trip that I was there. Um, Drew and I went together. Uh, Drew traveled with me. We uh, sat down with Brian and we got to see a little bit about his process, about how they make the pens, about uh, talk to some potential future opportunities. Um, got to hang out with his family, his cool son, Andrew, who is a super cool kid, knows a lot about video games and uh, wants to be a NASA scientist. So um, pretty cool kid. And uh, then got to talk a little bit about some nib tuning stuff. Um, as I mentioned, you know, Brian attended the nib tuning with Richard Bender, uh, the one that was never meant to be for me. So I, uh, I got to kind of get up to speed on some nib tuning stuff, which is something we've been trying to learn um, and uh, for some time and got to pick up some little tidbits there. So it was kind of a multifunction trip, a um, little short trip, just a few days, but uh, gained a lot of knowledge out of it. It's a lot of um, good collaboration. I'm trying to make an effort to see manufacturers, see distributors a little bit more because I'm learning as I'm going along in this business um, that there's uh, quite a bit that can be gained just from seeing how people operate. You learn about, a lot about their culture, their perspective, their history, um, and just kind of the way that they function and do business. And then it helps us with our relationship working with them. So it's something that I'm really put more of a focus on recently. Um, so that was kind of an effort to do that. So that was really cool. And then I went to California, which I won't go into great detail about that because I actually have a Q&A question about that this week. So I'm going to answer it in a little bit. Um, but I just got back from there, so I, um, I'm a member of a private e-commerce business forum um, where I get to talk about all the kind of inner workings and the runnings of our business, along with other people that do similar kind of e-commerce businesses. I've been in other, you know, um, CEO groups and roundtables and stuff like that before, and uh, there's always, you know, some good information to be shared with construction companies and insurance agents and financial brokers and real estate people and you know all people who do just general business things um, but e-commerce is really kind of a different breed so when you get a bunch of e-commerce people together uh, it gets pretty lively um, and pretty interesting because you're talking like shipping integrations and you know software and social media and uh, stuff like that so um, it was super super fruitful so uh, won't go into too much detail but uh, that was what that was it was all about just like a little three four day trip there um, got some new products that are going to be coming out, um, or that have come out actually, since I got like two weeks to cover here. Um, the Conklin All American in Old Glory. Uh, this is a color that's actually several years old, uh, but we just for some reason never really picked it up. And uh, we've had requests for it here and there, and we kind of just ended up putting it off. And kind of every time Fourth of July would roll around, we'd be like, "Oh yeah, we should carry this pen." Oh wait, it's already Fourth of July. Well, it's not really a Fourth of July pen. It just seems to kind of fit. So uh, we now have Old Glory. And you can pick that up if you are interested. Oh, Conklin All American is a pretty popular pen for us, so I don't know why we never picked it up, but here it is. This is how it goes sometimes when you have 3,600 products like we have. Uh, we got the Knock Brock, oh boy, Knock Brass Town 
in Mandarin and Steel. Uh, pretty cool looking case, so I recommend that you check that one out. It's a new color that Knock has that they just rolled out to all of their retailers. Uh, we also got a new ink color, Robert Oster Morning Mist. We launched that one, and there's several other Robert Oster colors that are going to be coming out too. Um, so be on the lookout for those. Robert Oster's uh, been kind of doing a little blitz, like four or five new ink colors, so that's pretty cool. So we'll have those coming out, uh, and I'll talk about those in a little bit. Uh, Keras Customs Fountain K and the Titanium Nibs, we have those now. So we've had the Titanium Nibs for the ink, the larger pen. So these ones are now for the Fountain K, which is a number five size Titanium Nib. Uh, which I really haven't seen before. So um, I actually haven't nib nooked them yet. I'm going to do that tomorrow morning. Uh, but uh, you can um, see this on the nib book here fairly soon, I would say, within the next week or so. Uh, but if you're looking for a mildly flexible nib in a number five size, um, you can check that one out. And then we have a new pen that is called the Conklin Classic, which is an exclusive that we kind of helped to co design with Conklin. It's an all ebonite pen. Originally, if I gotta be completely honest with you, and I'm, I can give you the inside scoop here on the Q&A, uh, originally it was supposed to be kind of an ebonite version of our Nighthawk, and we'd kind of unofficially dubbed it the ebonite hawk. Uh, but uh, what ended up happening is once we finally got the, the uh, prototypes in and, and got it all, we were just like, you know what, this really doesn't feel like a Nighthawk. So we renamed it uh, the classic, and instead of going with the Nighthawk kind of stealthy, edgy uh, vibe that we had going on with the Conklin Nighthawk, uh, we went with something that was a little more kind of the Conklin vintage look, because ebonite is a very vintagey kind of material, uh, and so we went with that vibe, and thinking about, um, you know, this was kind of coming off of visiting Edison, and actually getting to see Ohio, and it's very much like that middle America, kind of Americana farming country, so uh, we went with kind of that vibe. So the names that we chose for the classic are all kind of agriculture farming related. So we have uh, three different colors of the, of the Conklin Classic and they are named Harvest. They are named, uh, the next one is uh, Rainfall and the last one is Fire Lines, which Fire Lines, if you're not familiar, um, that's basically um, the lines uh, when when farmers are looking to kind of uh, get more nutrients in the soil they sometimes actually burn the fields of the old crops um, once they've been harvested and the fire line is the um, the fire edge kind of that's burned out on the field to contain uh, a controlled burn so that it doesn't uh, end up swooping out and getting carried away and burning things that it shouldn't so uh, fire lines is kind of a cool thing and and it kind of makes sense if you look at the uh, color of the pen. So that's pretty exciting. We're, we're eager for that. It's got Goulet nibs on it, Goulet stainless steel nibs. Um, and uh, it's very kind of a classic look to the pen. So I think, it, I think you'll be happy with that if you're into kind of that vintage -y kind of vibe. <clears throat> we're going to have lots of products coming up in the next few weeks. I mean, lots. So be ready for that. We just, for whatever reason, a lot of stuff. We had a few weeks where there wasn't much here right at the beginning of the year. And now we're going to be hit, hitting with a bunch of stuff kind of end of January, early February. So get ready for some cool stuff. I don't have a lot to share quite yet, but be ready in the next couple of weeks. You're going to see some cool stuff. And we're also going to be involved in a lot of different contests. We're going to be doing some giveaways and stuff like that. So be ready. We're hitting 2018 hard, ready to go. We are all pumped and excited. Uh, and then we are creeping up on February here, which is the month of Incorimo, which is the International Correspondence Writers Month. So it's basically a month of promoting writing a letter or a postcard to someone every day throughout the month of February. So actually handing off, mailing off a card of correspondence to someone for some reason. I'm just kind of promoting writing and promoting corresponding with people. So if you're in kind of an anti-social media movement mood, uh, you can actually mail some real stuff to people or just hand them out to people at work, write them a note card, whatever. It doesn't have to be mailed necessarily, um, but you can check that out and participate and it gives you kind of a fun reason to write with your pens. So kind of fun. All right, I got eight questions for you this week. Uh, I just felt like taking a little more than usual. So let's get into it, shall we? First one is a pen and writing question. This is from Della Pinala on Instagram. How do I grease the piston of the Stipula Tocofero? I was hoping it would be similar to other piston fillers or maybe require some finesse like the Lamy 2000, but its tapered body has me stumped and reluctant to start unscrewing things that may not unscrew. Thanks. 
Uh, well, Della Pinella, I would say that it's uh, it's complicated. It's not meant to be completely user disassemblable, which I know seems kind of weird because a lot of pens these days are kind of going that route. Um, but it's not that unusual, especially for um, you know some of the Italian pen companies that are used to making pens that are a little in the higher price range. Um, it's not unusual to have pens that are not completely user disassemblable. Um, and uh, that's some interesting feedback that I, uh, you know, can give to them because I'm more in direct communication with some of the manufacturers these days. And I think this whole idea of having user serviceable pens is still kind of a relatively newer concept um, for a lot of these pen companies, especially ones that have been around 60, 70, 80 years. Um, there was a time when, yeah, people were much more handy and they're familiar with them, so they work on them. And then there was a time where people were were not at all informed and could not work on them at all. And now I think with the rise of the internet and social media and the people sharing information very openly, very freely, um, having online tutorials on how to's on YouTube and stuff like that, um, doing videos like this, uh, I think it's much more common to be able to do that kind of stuff. So it's kind of making a resurgence, but not everybody's like jumping on the train and it's not always easy to develop every pen to be that way. Uh, and this is one that is not quite frankly. Um, so there's no way to like that I've discovered without basically breaking the pen uh, by experimenting, uh, by being able to remove the piston in the back end out of this thing. It's all kind of like glued and together and stuff like that. I've tried to like, like really ratchet it down almost to the point where I feel like I'm gonna break it. I haven't gone to the point where I actually did break it because I just frankly am not that brave and I like this pen and they're limited and I don't wanna go destroying it just for that purpose. Uh, but you can uh, kind of find a way around it. And uh, I hope I have some toothpicks handy because I wanted to actually demonstrate you. And I know whenever I sit down, there's always something that I forget. And then this time, it has been a toothpick. So if you can bear with me for a hot second, I'm gonna go grab a toothpick and then I can do a full demo for you. So hang tight. All right, got my toothpick. Here we go. So whenever you have a situation where you have a pen that's got a piston and you're not able to take it apart, as long as you're able to remove the nib unit out of it, you should be okay. Because basically what's going on here is you have the ink reservoir inside here, you have the piston, which moves up and down as you screw it and unscrew it. And the stipula, if you're not familiar with it, for whatever reason, their pistons go in the reverse direction. So normally you would go righty to have the piston come up and lefty counterclockwise to have the piston go down, but it's the opposite this way. So here I'm turning, so it's, it's, it feels very strange just because I don't know any other company that has it this way, but this is just the way the stipula does it. So if you are moving the piston up and down over time, the grease that's naturally in here uh, might kind of wear away, wear it break down and all that, and you're gonna feel more resistance to the piston on, this, on the side walls of the inside of the reservoir. So what, is nice is being able to maintain it and grease it up and keep it operating smoothly. So if you can't disassemble it back, like if you have with a, think about a Twisby or something like that, it's pretty easy. Noodler's pens, you're able to kind of remove them. Uh, you can't do that on this one, you know? Um, and there's several other pens that are like that. It's not super, super uncommon to have it. So um, one thing you can sometimes do is yank the nib and feed out like this, um, but you're gonna have not very much space to be able to get in here. So what we're gonna do, and since we can't get to the back end of this, we're gonna try going from the front end. And I'm gonna zoom in a little bit so you can see more what I have going on here. Okay, so here is our stipula. Okay, and uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to just take and I'm gonna grab right here um, with a little bit of pressure and I'm going to put some pressure on here. I don't wanna grab the end of the tines because I could end up bending it and that would not write very well. So I just grab that and then very firmly kind of put pressure on it. I'm holding it kind of like that, put pressure on it and I can just screw the body of the pen. And so what this is doing is it's removing the nib unit out of here. And it's just like if you have an Edison pen, um, I've shown that demo before, but this is what's going on. Now the only weird thing is it's got this O-ring on it, which is supposed to be up at the top. This is to help keep the ink from getting up into here or coming downward and it's basically just from hanging out up here when it's not supposed to. And that needs to be seated right at the edge of your nib housing. So just be aware of that, because if you remove it, um, that thing could get stuck up there, it could get lost, and then it could jam and cause some weird things. So just be conscious of that. And then if you look inside the pen here, let me see if I can get you some good light. You can see there's like this dark ring inside there, okay? So that is the connection point. 
um, where the nib housing connects to the inside of the barrel. So you have this orange barrel in here, that is your ink window, and that goes inside this metal grip, and then the housing connects up inside of the pen right here. So we don't have a ton of room to work with in here, but basically what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a toothpick and I'm going to um, use it to kind of work my way into the inside here. And then I can access the inside of the walls of the pen. Now it's not, there's not a ton of room to work there, so I'm actually gonna kind of bend the toothpick a little bit. It might kind of break just a tad, but what I'm gonna do is just, I'm gonna try and kind of hook it like that, okay? And then that way I can access the side walls of my piston, of my reservoir. So I just grab a little silicone grease, which I should have handy here somewhere. Okay, where is my silicone grease? Here we go. So I got a little giggly silicone grease. So I don't need a lot, but just a little bit of silicone grease on the edge of my toothpick, okay? You don't want a ton because you don't want to be getting it everywhere that it's not supposed to be. But you just want to get it, you know, like so. It's clear, so you can't really see it that well. But there you go, see it's a little bit on the end. And then I'm just gonna kind of work it right into the hole. Boom. And then I just take and kind of smear it, right? Can you see where I smeared it? Oh, it's starting really hard to focus on the pen. It wants to focus on my beautiful face here. Um, and then I just kind of rub it on the inside of the walls, okay? And then uh, you can do that a couple times, whatever you feel you need to. But basically once that is in place, oh gosh, there we go. I just forget which direction to turn it, especially when I use it in my left hand. Go back and forth, and it's gonna feel a little bit smoother. So you can do that a couple of times. It's not as good as if you can remove the entire thing and grease it up, but this is a pretty good substitute for being able to do it. And it just allows you to be able to service it. You don't need to do this a lot. Maybe once every, I don't know, four, six months if you're using it as you feel it's necessary. Um, and then to insert the housing back in, you just kinda wanna do the same thing, just kinda cut the nib uh, around your fingers like that, making sure not to, to do anything crazy with the tines. Make sure your O-ring is kind of seated up against there. And then just kind of seat it in the pen. The threads will screw in nicely. And make sure that O-ring seats in there well. Make sure it's not like sticking out. Make sure it doesn't have a, a ton of resistance. And then it should fit fairly flush when it's back in place. And there you go. And I've got the nib aligns nicely with the stipula and I'm pretty much good to go, and it's been re-greased. So that's the best way to do it. I would recommend doing this method. Um, it's a little bit safer. You know, the nib housing and stuff is pretty durable, and you're not gonna end up breaking anything, most likely. I can't guarantee that because I've seen some amazing things that people have done with pens that I thought could never be done. Uh, but uh, that should get you in pretty good shape. And again, you can use this method on a lot of other piston pens, not just this one. I've used it on Pelican pens. I've used it on the Lamy 2000. It can be very handy. Um, and it doesn't really take a lot of work, just a little silicone grease and a little toothpick, and you can be greased and good to go. All right. Next question is from Corey Frere on Instagram. Why do you think architect nibs are so much less common by, than stubs? I love the way they write, but I can't think of a single company that offers stock architect grinds. However, basically everyone offers at least one size stub. Um, I think there's a couple of different reasons for that. I don't know this for certain because um, I haven't really gotten good like information out from most companies that do architects um, or from any company that does architects really. I think the architect grind is something relatively uh, nouveau. It's not, I don't know the grind itself is that new, but I think the popularity of that grind is relatively new. I don't remember a lot of people talking about architects when I first got into the pen hobby, you know, eight, nine years ago. Uh, but I feel like it's really picked up speed in the last probably three or four years. It's really become much more popular, especially I think for people that are using uh, pens for print. I think the rise of Instagram, uh, I don't know this 100% for a fact, but I think I honestly think that the rise of Instagram has helped the popularity of the architect grind. Um, just people writing with it and stuff like that, doing more hand lettering, that's become a lot more popular. And I think that is, uh, has contributed to, to the demand for such a grind. So let me explain to you what an architect is versus a stub. I've explained this in some videos before, but I actually have the pens inked up where I can show you. So um, a stub nib is pretty um, you know, familiar. It's, it's a pen where it's ground. So you have a normal nib where it's ground like a ball, like this. 
uh, a stub nib is ground kind of flat and long like this. So then on the cross stroke, it's gonna be a thin line because it's a much thinner stroke. And on the down stroke, it's much wider, so you're gonna end up with a wide kind of swath. So if you, um, I'll go ahead and just kind of write out for you stub. And so on the cross stroke, if I'd thought about this, I would have um, maybe written this out ahead of time. But I did not. So now you get to sit here and watch me write. And then downstroke. Okay. So, kind of showing you what the writing is here. So the cross stroke is much thinner, and your downstroke is much thicker. So you can see here, so when you do writing, it's kind of like fake calligraphy, which I love because you don't have to write any differently than you do with a regular nib, but it allows your handwriting to look fancier. So it's pretty cool. So an architect nib, uh, also known as a Hebrew nib or an Arabic nib, um, it really is not that different. It's just the opposite direction. So it's ground in such a way where it looks almost more like a blade. Um, and it allows you to have a thick cross stroke and a thin downstroke. And I'm going to write with that now so that I can show you what is going on. All right, so let's see here. Architect. And this is a little more finicky. And I have to spell architect, which is harder. <laughs> cross stroke. The thing I will say about the architect nib is that you have to be more specific about the angle up and down that you hold it than you do with a stub. And I really can't multitask. So what you end up doing is having writing like this. So stub has a cross stroke that is thin across and thick down. And an architect has a cross stroke that is thick across and thin down. Honestly, when I'm writing with the two of them, I still get line variation and stuff like that. I don't notice as much of a difference between the two. Yes, there's a subtle difference. I don't notice as much of a difference between the two when I'm writing in cursive, but the print is where it can look really different. So I will try writing in print or especially block. So I'll write stub, nib, with the stub and architect. Forgive me all my audio listeners who are not seeing everything that I'm doing here. There you go, showing you in the video. So stub nib, writing it in block print versus an architect. So it can look a little different. The architect, I think, has a lot more character when you're doing it on uh, in a block print. So now you get to see the difference there. The reason why I think that people aren't offering the architect is because the architect is more difficult to make. It's more steps to grind. Um, I got to kind of test both of these and learn more about them while I was visiting with Brian Gray, which was pretty handy because it gave me a more in-depth knowledge than of, of these nibs than I had before. Um, and the stub is, is much more forgiving. So as in terms of a writing experience, it's a little easier to write with a stub, which I think most pen companies who are making these pens and selling them all over the world, they always have to balance out, <clears throat> you know, uh, how user-friendly some of these things are because if it's not as user-friendly it's going to end up coming back to them a lot as warranty repairs uh, because people are just not as familiar with them uh, they're more specialized grinds things like the architect uh, it, you have to kind of know what it is that you're getting into and I just don't think most people know what they're getting into with an architect I think it's a really cool nib I think it's a lot of fun uh, but do I think it's for everybody? Definitely not. It's a very much of a specialty grind. I think it's cool and it's very fun. Me personally, it's not a nib that I enjoy 
writing with on like a long-term basis because the basically the way the architect grind is actually I'm gonna go ahead and try and I'm gonna try to do this okay I'm gonna try to zoom in and show you the difference between the two um, so here's the stub nib this is an Edison Nouveau Premier past limited edition um, seasonal sorry not limited edition but seasonal that we did uh, back in 2014 it's called the Autumn Harvest and this is our current one Nightfall so the one on uh, your is this left yeah your left this is a stub nib so you can see how it's um, try and zoom in as much as humanly possible oh there we go oh that's pretty good um, so you can see here how it's ground so it's cross stroke is thin down stroke is fat and here is the architect so architect is similar but it's it's a blade it's more compound cuts much more handwork involved in getting this to write especially to get it to write well um, you can see kind of the difference between these two. Let me really try and get them so you can see what's going on there. Can you see the difference? Yeah. So it's it's a more compound cut. It's more complicated. You have to hold it when you're writing with it because of the way that it's cut. You can see here when I have it from the side um, that it has to be held at a very specific angle. So if your angle up and down with the architect is off at all, it's going to write scratchy and it's not going to flow properly. Um, whereas a stub is much more forgiving. It's a little less forgiving side to side, but then the architect, because it's a compound cut, is not super forgiving side to side either. So you have to write with the architect in a very, very specific, very unforgiving way. And it can look really cool, but it's not uh, something that anybody who you know, basically fountain pens are complicated enough for people that have never used them before. Um, and then when you get into having to hold it at a very, very specific angle, it can just be kind of complicated. So I think that's the reason why, if no other, that's the reason why most pen makers are not offering them stock. Uh, and then and you see these available from custom nibmeisters. Um, pretty much most of the nibmeisters, the architect is a fairly standard cut. I know Mark Bacchus, that's kind of his like specialty grind. If you, you know, consider it, as, um, um, you know, each nibmeister might have their specialty. I think like Mike Masayama is really known for extra fines. Uh, and then uh, Mark is kind of known more for his architects. So, um, but uh, it's something interesting to check out if you happen to be interested in that. And now you have at least a little more context as to what it is. All right, next question I have, I got a couple of ink questions actually. Um, so this is from History Joe 23 on Instagram. How do you decide which inks get sent as the random ink sample when we order one? Is it like an ink of the day or do you just throw a few of everything in a bucket and draw at random? Well, if it's a random ink sample, it has to be random, right? Um, no, actually, technically we call it the surprise me ink sample. Uh, so the randomness of it is not necessarily the goal, but is uh, that it is to surprise you as a person purchasing it. Um, so originally, uh, well, I'll start off and I'll say it's probably more intentional that you might than you might think. It's not like we've got this bucket of ink samples and it's like ah, we got these ones that we don't feel like doing anything with or that nobody wants to buy. So just take that junk and we'll just sell it as the random ones. Uh, no, it was originally sent out as hey, you know what, it's kind of like a little lottery, you don't know what you're gonna get if you're feeling kind of adventurous. We think we just thought it would be something kind of fun and interesting, it wasn't really a highly strategic move, it was just, hey, this might be fun, let's try it out and see if anybody wants to buy it. <laughs> uh, oddly enough, it is now our number one most popular Goulet product by volume. So I mean, what I mean by that is, the, is purely the number of products, which of course, it's an example, it's, very, very affordable compared to, you know, any pen that we would carry or anything like that or a bottle of ink. Um, but just looking purely at the numbers of how many things we sell, the, ran the, the Surprise Me ink sample, the random sample, is our most successful product. So uh, I think people just like to be surprised. It's interesting. We keep it at a pretty affordable price. So you might get an ink that is uh, more expensive. So you might get kind of a deal. So there's certainly all kinds of things like that. <laughs> that are kind of feeding into that. Um, but basically, um, you know, it, it's, uh, it's, you know, it started out as, as something just kind of fun. And uh, we would, we, way, the way we used to do it, and I explained this in a previous Q and A, but it's been like, I don't know, 100 episodes ago or something that I explained it. So I thought it would be time to refresh again. Uh, the way that it used to be is we didn't have any of our ink samples inventoried. So we would, we basically do up a bottle of ink, we would label it and have it ready to go, but we didn't, in, 
we didn't inventory individual ink samples because we were like, that's just way too much work. Uh, and how are we going to keep track of every single individual ink samples? Because we have um, 560 colors or something like that. It changes on a weekly basis, but um, we have a lot of colors. That's a lot of individual samples of all those colors to keep track of. So uh, we just didn't do it in the beginning. Uh, and so when we had an order for a random sample, uh, our team would, you know, kind of look at what else was ordered, maybe grab something that was kind of fun and interesting um, and go with that. It got to the point where uh, it was kind of unavoidable for us to uh, to stop from inventorying ink samples. So we, we had to start inventorying ink samples because we were selling things at such volume. And, and uh, what would happen is we would sell an ink sample and then uh, we wouldn't have any. We would be out of the bottle of ink. We would oversell. It was very painful uh, and a bad customer experience. So we decided we would inventory every single ink sample, which is what we do today. So now we can't just, as your order is coming in, just randomly pick something off the shelf because it's inventoried and we have to know it. So we have to intentionally do up a separate batch of ink samples that is the surprise me ink sample that is inventoried separately from the rest of all of our ink samples. Um, and because it's our number one selling ink sample, it's, uh, <laughs> it's very intentional. So um, we end up doing them, we, we do a mix of colors. So sometimes what we'll do is while we're sampling up other bottles, we'll kind of throw it in. Other times we will do you know colors specifically for the random thing, but we always try and get a really healthy mix. We do exclude some of the potentially more troublesome inks out of there, like the Noodler's base dates and certain scented and highlighter inks, some of the more obscure ones. Uh, but we try to get a good mix in there as much as possible. So it's not like any of the 500 some random colors could be the one, but it's probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 450, I think is, uh, you know, so anything that, that um, you know, a completely unsuspecting person wouldn't want to have to like put it in their vintage pen and they didn't know, we wouldn't, we wouldn't want to do that to anybody. So um, we try to be pretty intentional about how it is that we have it on there. Um, and uh, that's pretty much the whole process. You know, we have some people that will order dozens of surprise me samples at a time. Uh, so we can't just have like one color or an ink of the day or something like that. We got to have a good mix. Um, and uh, so we try to mix it up and keep it fresh. And uh, it's pretty popular. What can I say? So something fun, something we enjoy doing and uh, it's good for the community. So we'll keep it up. All right. Next question is from Mike W on Facebook. Give us your take on ink viscosity and flow. Are certain colors more apt to leak or burp than others? Um, viscosity definitely has an impact on flow. Uh, I'll be honest with you, I lack data, scientific data, on which inks are impacted the most by this. And I think that yes, definitely some colors are more affected by others. But I don't have any type of hard fast rule that's like yes, red inks always flow wetter or drier than blue inks or whatever. It's it's not that cut and dry. Um, I think, yeah, you could say that whatever, Noodler's Red performs differently than Pelican 4001 Royal Blue, but, you know, that's not specific to the, the tone, the color, uh, you know, specifically. It's more about the characteristics of that particular ink, which, of course, the color is almost more of a, a correlation than a causation there. Um, there are some inks with properties that make it more likely to flow than others. You know, I think about specifically some of the ones that are wetter writing, like the Noodler's Eel series, um, perhaps some of the um, fast dry inks, which, you know, flow smooth, you know, wetter out of the pen. Uh, but I think it's going to be much more individualized. It's going to vary because I think you end up with different dye components, different amounts of lubricant and things like that. Uh, and unfortunately, there's just no MSDS sheet. There's no you know, breakdown or properties or ingredients list on any of these ink bottles. So it's pretty much left to all of us, to our own devices to try to test these things. And I just, it is not something I've been able to wrap my head around uh, on any kind of grand scale. We have, uh, you know, ink property, you know, flow and wetness and stuff like that on the product reviews that we have on our site. We, you know, specifically built out these kind of customized rules for our product reviews. Uh, for ink that talks about flow and all that. So that's going to be one of the best ways. Or of course, you can look at individual reviews that people have done, bloggers and things like that, or there's stuff on the Fountain Pen Network that maybe people talked about in more generalities. Uh, but I just don't have uh, solid data on that. Um, you can try samples for yourself, of course. That's always good. Checking out ink reviews and stuff. And as far as like burping and all that, you know, 
I really don't have any specific correlation between ink uh, that is known to burp and ink that doesn't, especially related to color. It's, it's kind of more scattered, more random than that. Uh, it's more about the pen type too, like if you have an eyedropper converted pen, certain vintage pens that have large sacks and things like that, uh, pretty much any very high volume of ink. Uh, is going to be more prone to burp. And then certainly certain ink colors may be more likely than others to do that. I would think that there's a correlation between how viscous it is and how much it burps. But again, I have no data. So it's something you might have to experiment with or kind of uh, speak to the larger community. Um, but it's kind of like in the back of my mind, it's like, is there a better way at more of a macro level to review this or have this information somewhere? I just have not yet been able to wrap my head around it, especially with so many different inks and so many different variables going on, especially with something like burping. It just, uh, no one's been able to hack that one yet. So it's kind of up to your own experimentation. Cool. All right, I got a couple of business questions here, several business questions actually. Very businessy kind of week here this week. Um, so this one is from Spanny3L31. 3i, I can't tell if it's an i or an l or a 1, uh, on Twitter. A recent USA Today article reported a 42% unemployment drop in the stationary business since 2007. Ugh, it's not good for me. <laughs> Goulet pens and others like Leuchtturm 1917, however, seem to do just fine. What's the secret to your success in a dying business environment? Well, uh, specifically, I've read that article actually that you talked about, and I even talked about it in my company meeting this week because we were talking about 2018 and the different initiatives that we have here at Goulet. Um, we've grown basically every year since 2011. We've grown larger than we ever thought we would be. So each year we continue to be like, okay, we're in uncharted territory here. We don't know what's going to happen, but let's go for it. Um, you know, but of course, we're doing our thing here. It's, you know, we're super engaged with you all in the writing community, and I think that probably is our secret to success more than anything else. Uh, it's just, it's pretty common sense stuff, but if you're running a business, talk to the people that you serve, engage with them, and give them what they want. Like, it's not rocket science. Um, it's, it's not complicated, it's just hard, right? Like, it's just like leadership. It's not complicated, it's just hard. It's just hard work, it's hard to do it. It's a grind sometimes, and you just got to make it happen. Um, so that article that you that you are pointing to, I read that one. I kind of you know shared that with my team um, because we even still, even though we've reached kind of a cool place and we got this nice building and we could settle, uh, we are still taking on growth. I think you know years ago, Rachel and I, as stressful as things have been, um, you know we've we've gone through so much stuff personally professionally, every year we end up with some huge project, whether it's moving our website back in 2014, moving our building last year, you know, rebuilding our leadership team. There's some major effort that ends up happening pretty much every year that consumes a huge amount of our time and energy. And I think uh, that's probably part of the reason why most businesses uh, struggle is because in order to grow, you have to take on huge things basically every year uh, for perpetuity. Um, otherwise, uh, you end up just kind of stagnating. And I think, you know, I think we've figured out some things. I think the engagement thing, I think, you know, utilizing things like social media where we can be in direct contact with those of you who are avid pen users uh, helps tremendously. I know that's how I learned how to use fountain pens in the first place. So to me, it came very natural in order to be able to do that. But uh, it's not as natural for companies that have been around for a really, really long time and uh, are still kind of dealing with that. So um, for me specifically, I think that uh, I think that um, you know digital communication has impacted uh, you know this this industry a lot. You know specifically what was addressed in this article was talking about uh, manufacturing. Uh, it wasn't necessarily talking about retail, but I, I've seen a lot of brick and mortar uh, and online uh, pen stores go out of business since we came around in, in 2009 is really when, I mean, this article goes back to 2007. I wasn't paying attention to the pen industry back then. Uh, I was more focused on woodworking and 
crafts and stuff like that, uh, 2009 is when fountain pens really got on my radar. Uh, and so a lot of the uh, a lot of the companies that were that were being talked about then are either not the same as they were then or not around anymore. So I, I think that's been reflected pretty accurately even in the retail market. But that that article specifically addressed. Um, like office supply manufacturing and stuff like that. Um, and uh, so uh, I think that's probably true. I think about like Omos and Delta and other companies that have just disappeared completely. Other ones who are really kind of iconic, uh, especially from a manufacturing standpoint, uh, years ago, Parker, Waterman, Cross, Schaefer, um, these kind of iconic brands that were around for a long time are now just not that talked about and really not as big nearly as they once were and are kind of more reflecting what that's like. I think there's, um, you know, any niche industry like uh, like we're in here, you have to really pay attention, uh, especially when, you know, we're kind of swimming against the current <laughs> of what's going on in digital technology and communication. We have beautiful tools like video and audio and you know, mobile communication, things like that, that uh, have made a lot of previous forms of technology uh, obsolete or at least much less uh, commoditized. So now, uh, you know, there's you could get all sad about that and be like, oh man. And I think yes, on a, on some level, on a macro level, if you think about just a stagnant industry, oh man, that's really hard. You know, that specific article that listed the top 25 of uh, of industries that have really declined since 2007. Um, the number one at like 89% declining was like VHS and DVD rental companies, you know, thinking about like Blockbuster and companies like that. It's like, well, yeah, I mean, you have Netflix and Hulu and YouTube and all these things. Like, of course, that's been disrupted. Like, thank goodness. I don't have to get in my car and go drive and rent a VHS and bring it back. You know, it's like, that's good, you know, but it's not good for the people that were in the VHS industry. Like things change and things evolve. So we can get all depressed about it or we can say, okay, it's not serving the same purpose anymore that it did before. What purpose is it serving now? And how do we kind of put ourselves in the flow of reality of what's going on and get people excited about the really good aspects of what it is that we're doing? Yeah, it's true. Like fountain pens had their heyday in the early to mid 1900s before the bulk point came and completely disrupted it. And by the way, the fountain pen absolutely disrupted the dip pen and the quill industry. If you were a master quill maker back in 1875, you were scared of the fountain pen. You thought it was a terrible thing because it was going to put your trade out of business. So there's always a flow and things like that. I think, you know, fountain pens, they have not been mainstream in probably 60 to 70 years. So the fact that they're still around at all, I'm pretty impressed. So, you know, if you think about like looking at Goulet pens or whatever, or anybody that's in the fountain pen industry, um, the fact that we're able to grow and thrive it has less to do with uh, kind of the overall writing industry because the overall writing industry, I think, is not even really including fountain pens. You know, I think about when I went to go visit Pilot USA, even one of the, one of the main brands that we carry, Pilot USA, uh, in the distribution in the U.S., you know, I don't have any hard numbers, but just looking at their actual warehouse, their distribution warehouse, had, you know, 100,000 square feet or so of warehouse space, probably uh, 94,000 square feet of that was ballpoint, rollerball, pencil, you know, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and there was like one little corner that was their fine writing, which was their fountain pens and maquillé and vanishing points and all that kind of stuff. So just looking purely at the footprint of what was going through that building, the fine writing stuff, the fountain pen stuff is not really a part of that kind of mainstream overall thing. Uh, so I think part of it is we're in a niche. We have been for years. And like any niche, I think you have the opportunity to grow with better communication, better engagement, and doing some innovative and exciting things. I think if there's any secret success that I can point to, it's been the engagement of social media and then taking that and using that and being engaged with you on trying to create some excitement 
try and do education. I mean, this is 193 King 7th Q&A that I've done. I sit down and do this. When I went to the conference with all the e-commerce people and I was telling them, oh yeah, I've done you know, 1,300 videos and 1,800 blog posts and I sit down and do a Q&A an hour every week and I've been doing it for four and a half years and people are just like, what? They're like, that's insane. That's so much content. I'm like, yeah, like I love it. And that's what you got to do if you want to really stand out and try to do something that's special. You know, it's not like we're selling iPhones here. We're selling technology that's pretty old and uh, trying to get people excited about it. So um, it's just a different mindset. I think that, you know, if you, unless you have that like innovator disruptor kind of let's do something really interesting and, and tap into that passion, um, then, yeah, then you're probably going to fit more into that flow of the 42% drop. So... Um, all that to be said, you know, I think the grassroots engagement, the social media stuff has been our lifeblood. We have a really good sense of what's going on. And now I'm trying to take that information and talk to manufacturers and tell them, hey, this is what people want. It's not the same as it was 30, 10, four years ago. You know, it's different. And we got to keep current with what it is that people want and then use that to put out good products that are going to get people excited. And so I think that we've, we've put that into there. And there's a phrase that I really, really like that I heard from uh, one of my e-com friends that I just met. Um, and the phrase was, you can only coast downhill. So think about that. You can only coast downhill. So basically, if you want to grow, you need to be doing stuff. You need to be taking on new things and doing new things that you haven't done before. That's what I'm telling my team. That's what I tell to myself every day. And that's honestly what I'm telling to you right now. If you're working a job or if you're doing something with your family, if you are talking about your physical health or your mental wellness and you are doing the same thing or less today than you did yesterday, don't expect that you're going to grow or improve. It's not like you just kind of coast through and all of a sudden you're older and wiser and richer and healthier. No, the natural state, the natural order of things is decline. So you need to be working ahead and growing and working out your body if you want to build your muscles. You need to be spending time with the people you care about if you want to have stronger relationships. You need to be studying harder if you want to grow in your academics or in your career. You know, like This isn't complete rocket science here. You need to be putting forth the effort if you want to grow. And I think that um, you know industries that are seeing a decline... Um, you know, maybe it is uh, some of these companies are shifting into digital media and having a little less emphasis on some of the what is tr considered the traditional stationary kind of stuff. Um, I think it's a neat observation, but I don't look at it and go, oh, no, we're next. I look at it and go, that's not going to be us. You know, we're going to do some cool stuff and we're going to make it uh, make it different. And it's not not exactly talking about us here. We're going to do some cool stuff and make some pen history. And that's what I'm excited about. So uh, that's my perspective on the matter. It's a really interesting article. It's just kind of curious to see. A lot of textile uh, companies were in there. A lot of, um, uh, you know, kind of manufacturing like socks and hosiery and, you know, linens and, uh, you know, the video rental thing. What else was it? It had securities and exchanges, bank lending, just a lot of like more traditional institutional kind of stuff on there. So it's a cool article. Um, try to link it up in, in the... Uh, uh, description if you want to check it out. Uh, cool. All right. This is from Lucy Honeychurch on Twitter. Hello, Lucy. Uh, Hi, Brian. To which countries do you sell your products? What is your main market apart from the U.S.? Do some countries have particular preferences? Uh, for example, who orders a lot of shimmering inks? I hope my English is not too bad. Thank you for the time. You take free Q&As. Hey, Lucy. Well, that's cool. No, your English was great. Um, as you can tell, Lucy is not from the U.S. Um, uh, I believe you're from Germany, right? Uh, I think we've exchanged a little bit on Twitter, so that's cool. Um, love my German, my German friends there. I definitely appreciate Germany much more having been there. Um, it's a pretty cool country. So anyway, uh, so we, we sell basically anywhere in the world that USPS or FedEx will ship. There's a few conflict countries. There's a few, you know, countries that um, just we can't get to. Uh, but basically, we, you know, we, we have some, we have a, a handful of very small countries that um, we've just like every single order we've ever received from there was fraud. So we've just kind of shut it down. Uh, but those are very, very rare. Uh, for the most part, we ship any, anywhere that those uh, shipping carriers will send to. The U.S. is definitely our, our biggest market, you know, um, but other markets uh, for us mainly include primarily English speaking, uh, you know, countries like Canada, the U.K. Uh, and Australia. 
Uh, not shocking because I only speak English and that's what we put out all of our videos, all of our content, our websites in English, our you know, websites in dollar, American dollars. So it makes sense that that's how most of it would be. Um, there's certainly a barrier to entry for anybody who's um, you know, not from an English speaking country. Um, but sure, you know, if you speak English, you can make sense well enough of it. Um, you know, Germany is, is not bad and other Europe or European countries, not a whole lot to South America. Um, just because I think a lot of the customs and duties tend to be really crazy down there. Um, and it's different for every country. You know, there's rules and, and stuff about, you know, currency conversion. There's, uh, you know, duties, there's shipping costs, all that kind of stuff that can really inhibit buying from us. And I'm trying to do what I can. That was one of the things I was asking around at the e-com conference was asking other people. It's like, okay, how do you guys get good shipping rates, shipping out of the country? Is there something that I'm missing here? So I got a couple of things to follow up on, but it's uh, nothing super like obvious that I'm missing. I might have some leads to kind of chase down, but I, I can't make any promises at this point. Um, but it's certainly on my mind. Um, I don't have a strong sense of like which countries do best with things like shimmering ink. Um, the the amount of like data crunching that that requires to like take individual orders and break out all the items that were purchased and where they ship to and all that to map all that on like a macro level i just i haven't been able to do that easily um that would be really cool i think we would need to put some more like you know tools in place to be able to make that happen so i don't have a super good sense at that level um, but the thing i can say is that that um just from you know kind of seeing the orders that come through and, and what people are actually buying uh, it is mainly products that you can't find unless they're in the U.S. I'm thinking like a lot of Noodler's products, um, you know, Edison pens, you know, maybe like Harris Customs or like other things coming out of the U.S. that just aren't as widely available uh, outside, you know, especially for Goulet exclusives, like any, any of our Goulet products that we would have uh, are some of the more popular thing, ink samples, you know, stuff like that. Um, those are going to be the more popular things that are going to ship to countries outside the U.S. You know, am I going to sell Diamine ink to people in the U.K.? Probably not, because it comes from the U.K. You know, am I going to sell a lot of Pelican or Lamy pens to Germany? No, not really, because they're pretty available there and probably cheaper because you haven't had to pay to ship them there and back and everything. So, you know, it's it would make sense that, you know, products that originate out of the U.S. are going to sell better overseas than you know, things that are made overseas. Uh, and because we have um, mostly non-US products, because uh, countries like Japan, Germany, France, Italy, they have much stronger fountain pen cultures and that's where more of the manufacturers are. Uh, that's where most of our products end up coming from. So um, just kind of interesting little insight. Sorry, I don't have like deeper data for you, but just some little observations. All right, this next one's from Carl K on Facebook. What were some highlights of the Entrepreneur Conference you were planning to attend recently? And how will Goulet pens change from it? So uh, I've already kind of given away like half this answer already <laughs> throughout this Q&A. Um, but it was good. You know, it was a private forum conference this past week. Sorry, I'm not telling you the name, but it's just there's kind of a confidentiality thing involved with being in this conference. Um, so I just, you know, kind of asked that you respect that. Um, so, uh, you know, it's all for e-commerce business owners, you know, and I found that to be very helpful because when I've dealt with other people, even other people who've had inventory-based businesses, like I've had um, close relationships with people who have run like a catering company and other people who've done like flower shipping and maybe a, a you know, kid's toy, uh, physical retail store and, and stuff like that. Um, it just ends up being very different when you're involved in e-commerce, even different than a physical brick and mortar store, because you're the pace at which things move is so much faster. I'm not dealing at all with things like, um, you know, foot traffic and, um, you know, uh, local weather. You know, it's like we had snow today as I'm recording this, but that doesn't affect the huge amount of our customer base because you guys are spread out throughout the country and throughout the world. Uh, and what little local, you know, school closings or whatever we have here, other than affecting our team and our ability to function here, uh, it doesn't really affect your ability to shop with us. So, you know, there's just different, there's things like that that are just very different in e-commerce. Um, the pace at which things change and move, you know, I end up dealing with uh, competitors that are, you know, overseas or like eBay or Amazon or like, you know, sellers that will come and go very quickly. And just the pace at which things happen is, is very drastic. And um, it's kind of a global competition, global marketplace. So it ends up being a little crazier. Uh, it's a little bit more like the Wild West 
than it is uh, if you have like a physical brick and mortar store, or certainly if you're in another industry. If you're not in the retail industry at all, uh, then it ends up being entirely different. So it's, it's just some some uh, some real good help, um, you know, than being involved specifically with e-commerce people than it has been in other professional organizations that I belong to. Um, there's lots of conversation around social media, content marketing, um, you know, content creation, education type stuff like doing this. I talked to, you know, a guy who uh, runs a, um, a beard oil company. Like he makes like beard oil and does like, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, he has daily content that he puts out on YouTube and he's linked up with, um, you know, somebody that has a, a, a barber shop in the UK. So this is a guy, I forget exactly where he's from, might have been Texas or, or somewhere, um, and he linked up with this, this barber shop in the UK that helps him produce content. So like they, they put YouTube content of people getting their hair cut in the UK, and that's part of his content for the beard thing. And it's just like really interesting talking about like some of the strategies that other people have about creating content, just things I've never thought of before that are beneficial from talking to people in other industries. People that do some more interesting things uh, you know, using Facebook or might do different things with their email newsletter and just communicate differently. Um, you know, uh, I talked to one guy who does daily email newsletters and we've only done maybe two or three, four at the max during the holidays if things get really crazy. Um, but the idea of like a daily newsletter, like taking the personal message out of the newsletter, making it more robust and making that like a daily or a weekly thing on a certain day and having it be more regular, you know, just interesting stuff like that. And I was like, huh, I never thought about doing anything like that. Um, so just getting those types of ideas um, was really kind of interesting. Um, I came back. Oh, and then other things like software integrations and shipping rates and uh, customer service related stuff, loyalty programs, you know, this kind of stuff that other e-commerce people are doing. They're not necessarily like my direct competitors and they're not in the fountain pen space. So I can talk more freely with some of these people about what it is they're doing, about what we're doing and get some interesting collaboration, some ideas. Um, you know, a good example is, um, you know, we're gonna be doing a contest here uh, pretty soon with, um, you know, Kirby Allison with the Hangar Project. Um, now that wasn't a contact through this forum necessarily, um, but uh, that was one that a customer, a joint customer for both of our companies um, actually linked us up and, and said, hey, did you know that Kirby is shooting some uh, some videos and, and pointing people over to your store, you know, for fountain, fountain pen education? I was like, oh, that's cool. You know, I should I should reach out to him. Um, so I did that. That's actually how we linked up with Keras Customs back in the day too. Was um, you know Keras Customs when they started making pens on a Kickstarter, um, pointed to our, our educational content, um, and then a couple of years later it developed into a retailer relationship. Um, you know, I don't know that we're going to necessarily start selling shoe polish and high end hangers and stuff like that, like the Hanger Project does. Uh, <laughs> I don't anticipate that's going to happen, um, but we're going to be doing a joint contest together here um, in February. So I'll look out for that. We're going to be giving away a pretty sweet pen, M805 Ocean Swirl. Um, you know, so a little, a little Easter egg there for you. Uh, but it was it was really interesting. So just talk, just you know, just as an example of talking to somebody who does this kind of thing, completely different industry, um, but you know, has a YouTube channel does email, you know, newsletters and, you know, is looking to do a contest giveaway and we're going to be collaborating, you know, we haven't really done a lot of, we haven't really done a collaboration or giveaway with another retailer before. So that's kind of new for us and it's some new ground that we're testing out. So, um, you know, just, just uh, having ideas like that and doing some interesting things, it's like, oh, this is really kind of cool. You know, in the past, we've always done things like very insular and we're thinking about like, we create all the content. We do all of our giveaways. We do all that kind of stuff. We started to expand a little bit, you know, with like uh, Kara Benz and Jake Weidman and um, Declex and uh, you know Ryder Carroll. We so we've done. We've started to expand that a little bit um, and do some interesting stuff there with other. They're called influencers. You know, other people who are bloggers and people like that that have done some things. But you know, now it's like, oh, interesting, doing things with other retailers. So that could be kind of interesting, kind of cool. You know, not people that are completely unrelated, but you know, gentlemen's clothing, and you know, there could be other really cool people that do, I don't know, watches or people that do, who knows what, all kinds of interesting things that could kind of overlap with the fountain pen thing, um, and be kind of interesting experience for you all, and kind of you know, create some unique connections there across our communities and. Um, could be kind of cool. So it's these types of things that are like running through my mind uh, for 2018. So, um, you know, that to say, um, this isn't my question of the week, but as I'm kind of talking through it, I'm like, huh, 
Actually, this would be kind of cool. So if you have any ideas for people that we could collaborate with, like maybe you're super into this and you're super into knitting and you're like, oh my gosh, the Goulet Pens of Knitting is such and such, knitfest.com or something. I just completely made that up. I don't know if that's a real thing. But um, like knitfest.com, uh, you two should do a joint thing together. It would be amazing. Go ahead and let me know about that, um, either in the comments um, or uh, shoot an email to social at gulepens.com. Um, and that would be really cool to get some ideas there. Um, uh, so we're always looking out for that kind of stuff. And I think it's, it's fun. We're going to be playing a lot of giveaways and a lot of contests and stuff here coming up in 2018. All right, last question. This is a uh, personal one. This is from Liam Morin on Twitter. I'm curious what or who inspires you as a business owner and entrepreneur? How do you think or how do you keep things evolving and exciting while staying true to your ideals and principles as a leader? Uh, interesting question. I'm in a very like biz dev kind of space here today, apparently, because it took a lot of these questions. Um, so for me, I'm a very avid reader, so I get inspired, uh, particularly by entrepreneurs who write books. You know, that's just kind of, um, uh, I, I've been inspired by that because I, I appreciate books very much. I appreciate um, being able to learn from other people's actual experiences. I'm not so much of the like academic study a textbook kind of situation. Uh, I I I'm not gonna say I struggled through school. I didn't. I did okay academically. I don't have like the famous claim to fame of like Albert Einstein failed in school and became this brilliant physicist or like Gary Vaynerchuk got D's and F's that kind of thing. Yeah, sorry, I can't make those claims. I was a I was a B student, a B plus student, you know, um, because I worked really hard and and I did okay, but I always studied my tail off, and I was never the smartest kid in the class, you know. So in that way, I always struggled because I know that I worked harder than most other kids in the class, and I did better than some of them, <laughs> but most of the time it was just not great. Like I would never nail a test. You know, I would study my tail off and maybe get a 92. You know what I mean? So it just, it was never just super easy and natural to me, which actually I think uh, worked to my advantage because part of the reason I work so hard now is because I've kind of always had to work hard just to kind of achieve what it is that I thought I was capable of. But anyway, that's a little bit of a diversion. Um, so I glean a lot of information um, from a lot of different people and situations. I think, you know, if I... If I could credit a, a gift that I have been given, it's the ability to learn from other people's experiences and not have to make the same mistakes myself and be able to take what they have gone through and use that to save myself from having to make the same mistakes, which believe me, is not a gift that everybody has. And you may even be looking at yourself and going, dang it, I wish I had that. <laughs> so um, I know that I have uh, more of that ability. Does definitely doesn't mean I got it all figured out, but I, I do gain a tremendous amount of insight from reading about other people, talking about their experiences, really reflective. That's why I think books are good. I do gain a lot from having conversations, but there's something about a book that um, forces people to really summarize and um, solidify what it was that they went through. Uh, and I'm able to really parse out a lot of good information out of the books that people write. Um, so I'm a completely nonfiction reader. I can't, I just can't get through a fiction book. Um, I've tried reading some biographies. Those are okay. Like I read, you know, The Rise of Teddy Roosevelt and all this kind of stuff. Uh, and those are okay, but they're just a little too factual for me. Uh, I, I read opinionated stuff. I read, I like reading, you know, the more autobiographical stuff of people kind of talking about what they've done and summarizing some of the principles of what they've uh, been through. I find that to be the most beneficial for me. So my influence comes more from those uh, types of people. So, um, and particularly I'm impacted by people who, um, you know, more or less come from like average or below average means, you know, kind of like the American dream type story, right? Like not as much from the like, you know, investment banker went to Harvard. You have a case study about their business and all that kind of stuff. I'm like, that's a little less relatable for me. You know, <laughs> I gain a lot from people that I can relate to and uh, from people that have kind of pulled themselves up by their bootstraps kind of thing. Um, so for sure, that's what ends up working really well. Sorry, I'm getting a phone call and uh, I will have to take that in a minute. Um, so for me, some of the people that I've um, 
you know, benefit of the most some are people who just have massive amounts of grit. Uh, I'm very inspired by people with grit that have these incredible stories of not even people necessarily that did like these unbelievable things, but people that just really kind of put it together themselves. I find that I can gain a lot uh, out of hearing their stories. Um, you know, Gary Vaynerchuk for sure is a huge influence for me. He's part of the reason why I do these videos. And, um, you know, I kind of will get hot and cold with him because he's a very intense uh, speaker and his language is pretty salty. Uh, so not necessarily the kind of thing I'm like watching in front of my kids, uh, but it can be pretty motivational sometimes, especially because, you know, to be very candid with you all, uh, being an entrepreneur, and I, I almost hesitate to even use that word because it's such a buzzword these days. Like you go on Instagram and there's so you just go on Instagram and look at the hashtag entrepreneur. You're going to see so many people in their young 20s taking a picture of themselves with their watch in front of a Bentley. And you're like, that's a fake watch. And that Bentley is one that you just saw on the street. Like there's so many people faking it and, and looking the part of entrepreneur. And I don't even, I don't even know if I feel that that's the appropriate term for me. I, yes, Rachel and I, we started a business together. Um, you know, I don't know if that makes us an entrepreneur. I feel like I meet other people who are really like the blue blood definition of an entrepreneur. Like they will sell the shoes off their kids' feet for a buck. Like they're just that hardcore about it. And maybe that's just an extreme example. Maybe I should, maybe I, you know, I wouldn't sell the shoes off my kids' feet for a buck. I have somewhat more of a perspective than that. But, um, you know, for sure, I, I don't fit into the mold of let me go work a nine to five job. I, I need to work for myself because my hustle and drive is just so uh, beyond what I think I would be happy doing in a corporate job. And uh, I just, I, I worked like one internship out of college and three days into it, I was like, nope, can't do this. I need to be doing my own thing. So I don't know, whatever it is, not does being anti-authoritarian and not being able to work for anybody else make you an entrepreneur? I don't know, but that's the path that I end up taking as a result. So uh, for sure, that's the way I'm worried if that makes me an entrepreneur, okay. Um, but I just, I hesitate because there's that buzzword there. Um, but Gary Vaynerchuk, for sure, he like exemplifies kind of that entrepreneur, entrepreneur vibe, but he's also a very, very genuine dude. So at the surface level, um, he's, he's very much got that kind of flash and that, that um, uh, panache, you know, that vibe um, of kind of the, the jerk entrepreneur, but, but he is a pretty genuine dude. I've met him face to face before and got to thank him for making his videos and stuff. Uh, and he was super, super genuine. Like, you know how you just meet somebody and you can tell um, there is, there is that genuineness there. Uh, I got that vibe with him, which was pretty cool. Um, other people that I'm really inspired by, you know, Simon Sinek, um, I actually end up putting, uh, start with why up there next to Gary Vee's book. Um, Simon Sinek, um, you know, him as a person, I actually don't know that much about him as a person. I haven't followed him as deeply, but he has had some really profound concepts from his book, especially start with why. Um, that have really been good. The concept of the golden circle, it's got a really good quote that I love that says, people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. Um, and that's just really important. You can think buy is like selling stuff, but it's also buy is in like a relationship. Like why should somebody have a relationship with you? It's not what you do, it's why you do it. So it's like just starting with why, getting to that deeper place. That's really cool, I totally dig that concept. And also his, his ideas of leadership is very much in that kind of like servant leadership mentality that I really like. Um, some other people I've been really inspired by, um, Sarah Blakely from Spanx. Um, if you haven't heard her story, it's pretty unbelievable. Um, uh, very innovative, very much like, you know, had an idea for something that just she knew just needed to exist. Um, didn't come up with a 10-year business plan kind of thing, but like just made it happen and freaking grinded it. So I appreciate that. She's the one who created Spanx, um, the undergarment, um, and uh, has has really hustled and built a pretty incredible business. Um, I think she was like the youngest female billionaire uh, in history or something like that. So yeah, she's definitely blown it up into something unreal, um, but also a pretty, pretty um, interesting person. She did a really cool interview on how I built this, the NPR podcast. Um, if you get a chance to listen to that, it's pretty cool. Um, and along those same lines from that same NPR podcast, How I Built This, um, I heard the story of Kathy Hughes, um, who started Radio One. And her story just really blew me away because she had like some legit setbacks. You know, single mom, uh, 
lived, like she started a, a radio station. She like bought her first radio station at like maybe 31 or something and like lived in the radio station with her kid for like seven years to get this thing off the ground. Like had a kid at 17, took the kid with her to her college classes because she didn't have babysitting and stuff. And, and, and the way she talks about it was not even like, this was so hard, look at me. Oh, it was so much harder back then. But she talks about it like, it wasn't that hard. It was an infant, you know? They would, you know, whine a little bit, I'd take her out and then, you know, come back and do my class. She's like, it wasn't that hard. And just like that mentality of like, it wasn't that hard, like what choice did I have? You know, I wanted this and I had to do it. Just like, you listen to somebody like that and then you hear about, you know, other people complaining about having too much cream in their coffee at Starbucks and you're just like, this person has a very different frame of mind than, you know, this person. I think I like Kathy's mindset. <laughs> Um, just really impresses impresses me like just that kind of like no excuses kind of mentality. I get inspired by that A um, couple other, you know, kind of business leader type people like Dave Ramsey and Pat Lencioni um, More from like an organizational health management kind of uh, perspective so I've been able to read their books and, and it was it was a little less theoretical and much more like kind of practical in terms of like how should I structure my meetings? What is what should my hiring process be? I was able to pull some really good stuff out of there um, and then from an kind of an entertainment standpoint, uh, just going completely not from like the, the business leadership kind of thing, but um, Tina Fey. I'm a huge fan of 30 Rock. I find Tina Fey to be funny and incredibly, um, you know, creative and just a straight hustler. Like being able to direct and write and act and produce and everything. Like I know she works like a dog and she's just output some incredibly thoughtful stuff. So as an entertainer, I can very much appreciate, a performer, I can appreciate what she does. Um, plus, you know, she looks a lot like Rachel, so she kind of reminds me of <laughs> her personality. Some similar to Rachel in some ways too, so always pleasant to uh, watch somebody that's similar to someone that I enjoy very much. Um, so that's kind of cool. So I consider myself very fortunate just because, um, you know, this is kind of like, uh, like you said, the evolving and excitement kind of thing. How do I keep that going? Um, you know, for me, it just kind of comes naturally. Like I'm naturally driven to create and learn and evolve. Uh, I don't know that I would be able to do it any other way. Um, so I guess I have that somewhat to my advantage. Um, so it comes somewhat naturally, uh, like most founders uh, of a company, I think I have a very heavy stamp on my own personal kind of ideals and values here at Goulet Pens. Um, a lot of that has to do with the fact that it was just Rachel and I for a long time and just the way that we operated the business, um, we put everything of ourselves into it. I mean, we, not joking, started this business uh, as we were forming the life of our first child inside Rachel's womb, you know? So there is quite a bit of not the, the actual, but the figurative DNA of ourselves and our family woven into this business. So in, in that respect, um, you know, it makes it somewhat easier for me to be a leader and to operate in this business in alignment with my personal values because so much of my personal values are into it. It's not everything. It's not like, you know, I put, you know, work your tail off every night and weekend as a company value. That's more of a personal value of mine. Uh, but we do have work hard, you know, and what that looks like here can look a little bit different, you know, but um, I don't expect everybody to put in the hours that I do because that's more of a personal thing that I do. Um, but at the same time, you know, um, as we grow and as we, we change, we have to grow and, and kind of shift with it. I've had to very much shift my own mentality as a leader uh, as we've grown. Uh, for the first couple of years, I actively resisted hiring anyone because I wanted to do everything myself and control everything and, you know, have pride in my work and it was very much of a craftsman mentality. Um, and uh, there was a big mental shift I had to make. So I've had to turn over a couple of times in my own mind what life looks like for me as a leader. Um, and again, a lot of the benefit from that comes from looking at other people and what they've gone through, specifically people that have started something from nothing and scaled it a little bit um, because I get to see like, man, at what point do you have to make that decision to hire someone? Or at what point do you have to make that decision to have your first manager? At what point do you have to make that decision to build a leadership team? At what point do you make that decision to start a succession plan and training somebody to backfill you so you might not be there one day? Like these are all steps that other people have gone through and I don't want to reinvent the wheel so I can read up and be inspired by people that have done things 
uh, like that. And, uh, and that's pretty cool. So uh, on the flip side of that, you know, to bring it down and get a little more real, uh, I struggle with consistency and stability probably more than most, uh, as you could may not shock you. I'm a bit of a disruptive force uh, around here. Even this week with our company meeting, I was like talking about our 2018 initiatives. Uh, I definitely had a little bit of, a little bit of fire in me <laughs> over that one. So, uh, uh, you know, my team, I think, uh, looks to me for that, uh, knows that that's part of what I bring and, uh, you know, may or may not like it at all times, but I, it's kind of who I am. So I can't really help it. Um, if we've taken the disc personality profile for any of you that are familiar with that, and there's one of the letters on disc is the S which stands for stability or steadiness or stabilizing or whatever S word you want to use for that. Um, and out of like, I think the scale is like 10 to 100, uh, 10 being the lowest, uh, mine is a 17. So I'm not, on, I'm not on the floor, but I'm pretty low, you know, because I'm a disruptive force and I just come up with ideas. And um, so if you're looking for somebody to be steady and consistent, I'm not always one. The fact that I've done 197 Q and A's is pretty miraculous actually. This might be the one you know, kind of semi-consistent thing that I actually do. <laughs> I consistently talk too much and too long in a Q&A, specifically when it's about myself. Anyway, um, so that's about all I got for this week. My question of the week for this week uh, kind of comes off the one I just answered. Uh, I would like to know who inspires you. Uh, I hope to get all kinds of different random answers and hopefully they won't just be like businessy or anything like that. I'm just very curious. Maybe it's your mom, maybe it's a teacher that you had, maybe it's, uh, you know, some sort of business figure or entrepreneur, or maybe it's, uh, I don't know, religious figure, whatever it is. I'm just very curious to know kind of, uh, of the, of those of you who kind of follow us and what we do, um, who are the people that inspire you to do what you do every day. Uh, that's it for this week. Uh, I will see you again next week. Again, I'm not traveling so much, so I will be doing Q and A's uh, with somewhat more regularity. So I'm looking forward to that. So I hope you are staying warm. Those of you who are in snowy weather, like we are here in Virginia, uh, I hope you are able to enjoy yourselves. Thanks so much for watching and right on.